Disc 16, Soul Music By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 4x18 I'm on the back of a horse a hundred feet up in the air, being taken somewhere somewhere mysterious that's a bit like a magic land with goblins and talking animals. There's only so much more trouble I could get into. Besides, is riding a flying horse against school rules? I bet it's not written down anywhere. Quirm vanished behind her, and the world opened up in a pattern of darkness and moonlight silver. A checkerboard pattern of fields strobed by in the moonlight, with the occasional light of an isolated farm. Ragged clouds whipped past and away. Away on her left the Ramtop Mountains were a cold white wall. On her right, the rim ocean carried a pathway to the moon. There was no wind, or even a great sensation of speed just the land flashing by, and the long slow strides of Binky. And then someone spilled gold on the night. Clouds parted in front of her and there, spread below, was Ankh-Morpork a city containing more peril than even Miss Butts could imagine. Torchlight outlined a pattern of streets into which Quirm would have not only been lost but mugged and pushed into the river as well. Binky cantered easily over the rooftops. Susan could hear the sounds of the streets, even individual voices, but there was also the great roar of the city, like some kind of insect hive. Upper windows drifted by, each one a glow of candlelight. The horse dropped through the smoky air and landed neatly and at the trot in an alley, which was otherwise empty except for a closed door and a sign with a torch over it. Susan Reed Curry Gardens Kitchen and Lance Keep Out R.I.S. means you. Binky seemed to be waiting for something. Susan had expected a more exotic destination. She knew about curry. They had curry at school, under the name of bogey and rice. It was yellow. There were soggy raisins and peas in it. Binky whinnied, and stamped a hoof. A hatch in the door flew open. Susan got a brief impression of a face against the fiery atmosphere of the kitchen. Durmer, Nurmer. Binkormer. The hatch slammed shut again. Obviously something was meant to happen. She stared at a menu nailed to the wall. It was misspelled, of course, because the menu of the folkier kind of restaurant always has to have misspellings in it, so that customers can be lured into a false sense of superiority. She couldn't recognize the names of most of the dishes, which included Curry with vegetable 8 pea curry with sweat, and sore balls of pig 10 zero pea curry with swear and sour, ball of fish 10 zero pea curry with meat 10 zero pea curry with named meat 15 five pea extra curry 5 pea porn cracker 4 pea eat it here or, take it away the hatch snapped open again and a large brown bag of allegedly but not really waterproof paper was dumped on the little ledge in front of it. Then the hatch slammed shut again. Susan reached out carefully. The smell rising from the bag had a sort of thermic lance quality that warned against metal cutlery. But tea had been a long time ago. She realized she didn't have any money on her. On the other hand, no one had asked her for any. But the world would go to rack and ruin if people didn't recognize their responsibilities. She leaned forward and knocked on the door excuse me. Don't you want anything? There was shouting and a crash from inside, as if half a dozen people were fighting to get under the same table. Oh. How nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, said Susan, politely. Binky walked away, slowly. This time there was no bunched leap of muscle power he trotted into the air carefully as if sometime in the past he'd been scolded for spilling something. Susan tried the curry several hundred feet above the speeding landscape, and then threw it away as politely as possible. It was very, unusual, she said. And that's it. You carried me all the way up here for takeaway food. The ground schemed past faster, and it crept over her that the horse was going a lot faster now a full gallop instead of the easy canter. A bunching of muscle. 
and then the sky ahead of her erupted blue for a moment. Behind her, unseen because light was standing around red with embarrassment, asking itself what had happened, a pair of hoof prints burned in the air for a moment and then faded. It was a landscape, hanging in space. There was a squat little house, with a garden around it. There were fields, and distant mountains. Susan stared at it as Binky slowed. There was no depth. As the horse swung around for a landing, the landscape was revealed as a mere surface, a thin-shaped film of, existence, imposed on nothingness. She expected it to tear when the horse landed, but there was only a faint crunch and a scatter of gravel. Binky trotted around the house and into the stable yard, where he stood and waited. Susan got off, gingerly. The ground felt solid enough under her feet. She reached down and scratched at the gravel, there was more gravel underneath. She'd heard that the tooth fairy collected teeth. Think about it logically, the only other people who collected any bits of bodies did so for very suspicious purposes, and usually to harm or control other people. The tooth fairies must have half the children in the world under their control. And this didn't look like the house of that sort of person. The hog father apparently lived in some kind of horrible slaughterhouse in the mountains, festooned with sausages and black puddings and painted a terrible blood red. Which suggested style. A nasty style, but at least style of a sort. This place didn't have style of any sort. The Soul Cake Tuesday Duck didn't apparently have any kind of a home. Nor did Old Man Trouble or the Sandman, as far as she knew. She walked around the house, which wasn't much larger than a cottage. Definitely. Whoever lived here had no taste at all. She found the front door. It was black, with a knocker in the shape of an omega. Susan reached for it, but the door opened by itself. And the hall stretched away in front of her, far bigger than the outside of the house could possibly contain. She could distantly make out a stairway wide enough for the tap dancing finale in a musical. There was something else wrong with the perspective. There clearly was a wall a long way off but, at the same time, it looked as though it was painted in the air a mere fifteen feet or so away. It was as if distance was optional. There was a large clock against one wall. Its slow tick filled the immense space. There's a room, she thought. I remember the room of whispers. Doors lined the hall at wide intervals. Or short intervals, if you looked at it another way. She tried to walk toward the nearest one, and gave up after a few wildly teetering steps. Finally she managed to reach it by taking aim and then shutting her eyes. The door was at one and the same time about normal human size and immensely big. There was a highly ornate frame around it with the skull and bones motif. She pushed the door open. This room could have housed a small town. A small area of carpet occupied the middle distance, no more than a hectare in size. It took Susan several minutes to reach the edge. It was a room within a room. There was a large, heavy-looking desk on a raised dais, with a leather swivel chair behind it. There was a large model of the disc world on a sort of ornament made of four elephants standing on the shell of a turtle. There were several bookshelves, the large volumes piled in the haphazard fashion of people who were far too busy using the books ever to arrange them properly. There was even a window, hanging in the air a few feet above the ground. But there were no walls. There was nothing between the edge of the carpet and the walls of the greater room except floor and even that was far too precise a word for it. It didn't look like rock and it certainly wasn't wood. It made no sound when Susan walked on it. It was simply surface, in the purely geometrical sense. The carpet had a skull and bones pattern. It was also black. Everything was black, or a shade of grey. Here and there a tint suggested a very deep purple or ocean depth blue. In the distance, 
toward the walls of the greater room, the meta room, or whatever it was, there was the suggestion of something. Something was casting complicated shadows, too far away to be clearly seen. Susan got up onto the dais. There was something odd about the things around her. Of course, there was everything odd about the things around her, but it was a huge major oddness that was simply in their nature. She could ignore it. But there was an oddness on a human level. Everything was just slightly wrong, as if it had been made by someone who hadn't fully comprehended its purpose. There was a blotter on the oversized desk but it was part of it, fused to the surface. The drawers were just raised areas of wood, impossible to open. Whoever had made the desk had seen desks, but hadn't understood deskishness. There was even some sort of desk ornament. It was just a slab of lead, with a thread hanging down one side and a shiny round metal ball on the end of the thread. If you raised the ball it swung down and thumped into the lead, just once. She didn't try to sit in the chair. There was a deep pit in the leather. Someone had spent a lot of time sitting there. She glanced at the spines of the books. They were in a language she couldn't understand. She trekked back to the distant door, went out into the hall, and tried the next door. A suspicion was beginning to form in her mind. The door led to another huge room, but this one was full of shelves, floor to distant, cloud-hung ceiling. Every shelf was lined with hourglasses. The sand pouring from the past to the future filled the room with a sound like surf, a noise made up of a billion small sounds. Susan walked between the shelves. It was like being in a crowd. Her eye was caught by a movement on a nearby shelf. In most of the hourglasses the falling sand was a solid silver line but in this one, just as she watched, the line vanished. The last grain of sand tumbled into the bottom bulb. The hourglass vanished, with a small pop. A moment later another one appeared in its place, with the faintest of pings. In front of her eyes, sand began to fall. And she was aware that this process was going on all over the room. Old hourglasses vanished, new ones took their place. She knew about this, too. She reached out and picked up a glass, bit her lip thoughtfully, and started to turn the thing upside down. Squeak. She spun around. The death of rats was on the shelf behind her. It raised an admonitory finger. All right, said Susan. She put the glass back in its place. Squeak no. I haven't finished looking. Susan set off for the door with the rat scrittering across the floor after her. The third room turned out to be the bathroom. Susan hesitated. You expected our glasses in this place. You expected the skull and bones motif. But you didn't expect the very large white porcelain tub, on its own raised podium like a throne, with giant brass taps and in faded blue letters just over the thing that held the plug chain the words. C. H. Lavatory and Son, Malimag St. Ankh-Morpork. You didn't expect the rubber duck. It was yellow. You didn't expect the soap. It was suitably bone white, but looked as if it had never been used. Beside it was a bar of orange soap which certainly had been used it was hardly more than a sliver. It smelled a lot like the vicious stuff used at school. The bath, though big, was a human thing. There was brown lined crazing around the plug hole and a stain where the tap had dripped. But almost everything else had been designed by the person who hadn't understood deskishness, and now hadn't understood ablutionology either. They had created a towel rail an entire athletics team could have used for training. The black towels on it were fused onto it and were quite hard. Whoever actually used the bathroom probably dried themselves on one white and blue, very worn towel with the initials Y.M.R.C.I.G.B.S.A. A.M. on it. There was even a lavatory, 
another fine example of C. H. Lavatory's porcelainic art, with an embossed frieze of green and blue flowers on the cistern. And again, like the bath and the soap, it suggested that this room had been built by someone, and then someone else had come along afterward to add small details. Someone with a better knowledge of plumbing, for a start. And someone else who understood, really understood, that towels should be soft and capable of drying people, and soap should be capable of bubbles. You didn't expect any of it until you saw it. And then it was like seeing it again. The bald towel dropped off the rail and skipped across the floor, until it fell away to reveal the death of rats. Squeak. Oh, all right, said Susan. Where do you want me to go now? The rat scurried to the open door and disappeared into the hall. Susan followed it to yet another door. She turned yet another handle. Another room within a room lay beyond. There was a tiny area of lit tiling in the darkness, containing the distant vision of a table, a few chairs, a kitchen dresser and someone. A hunched figure was sitting at the table. As Susan cautiously approached she heard the rattle of cutlery on a plate. An old man was eating his supper, very noisily. In between forkfuls, he was talking to himself with his mouth full. It was a kind of auto bad manners. S not my fault. Spray, I was against it from the start but, oh no, he has to go and, recover piece of ballistic sausage from table. Start getting involved, I told him, I s not as if you're not involved, stab unidentified fried object, oh no, that's not his way, spray, jab fork at the air, once you get involved like that, I said, how are you getting out, tell me that, make temporary egg and ketchup sandwich, but, oh no Susan walked around the patch of carpet. The man took no notice. The death of rats shinned up the table leg and landed on a slice of fried bread. Oh. It's you. Squeak. The old man looked around. Where? Where? Susan stepped onto the carpet. The man stood up so quickly that his chair fell over. Who the hells are you? Could you stop pointing that sharp bacon at me? I asked you a question, young woman. I'm Susan. This didn't sound enough. Duchess of Stohelet, she added. The man's wrinkled face wrinkled still further as he strove to comprehend this. Then he turned away and threw his hands up in the air. Oh, yes, he bawled, to the room in general. That just puts the entire tin lid on it, that does. He waved a finger at the death of rats, who leaned backward. You cheating little rodent. Oh, yes. I smell a rat here. Squeak. The shaking finger stopped suddenly. The man spun around. How did you manage to walk through the wall? I'm sorry, said Susan, backing away. I didn't know there was one. What do you call this then, clatch and mist? The man slapped the air. The hippo of memory wallowed. Albert, said Susan. Right. Albert thumped his forehead with the palm of his hand. Worse and worse. What v you been telling her? He didn't tell me anything except squeak and I don't know what that means, said Susan. But, look, there's no wall here, there's just, Albert wrenched open a drawer. Observe he said sharply. Hammer, right? Nail, right? Watch. He hammered the nail into the air about five feet up at the edge of the tiled area. It hung there. Wall, said Albert. Susan reached out gingerly and touched the nail. It had a sticky feel, a little like static electricity. Well, it doesn't feel like a wall to me. She managed. Squeak. Albert dropped the hammer on the table. He wasn't a small man, Susan realized. 
He was quite tall, but he walked with the kind of lopsided stoop normally associated with laboratory assistants of an Igor turn of mind. I give in, he said, wagging his finger at Susan again. I told him no good d come of it. He started meddling, and next thing a mere chit of a girl who where'd you go? Susan walked over to the table while Albert waved his arms in the air, trying to find her. There was a cheeseboard on the table, and a snuff box. And a string of sausages. No fresh vegetables at all. Miss Butts advocated avoiding fried foods and eating plenty of vegetables for what she referred to as daily health. She put a lot of troubles down to an absence of daily health. Albert looked like the embodiment of them all as he scuttled around the kitchen, grabbing at the air. She sat in the chair as he danced past. Albert stopped moving, and put his hand over one eye. Then he turned, very carefully. The one visible eye was screwed up in a frantic effort of concentration. He squinted at the chair, his eye watering with effort. That's pretty good, he said, quietly, all right. You're here. The rat and the horse brought you. Damn fool things. They think it's the right thing to do. What right thing to do, said Susan. And I'm not a, what you said. Albert stared at her. The master could do that, he said at last. It's part of the job. I spect you found you could do it a long time ago, eh? Not be noticed when you didn't want to be. Squeak, said the death of rats. What, said Albert. Squeak. He says to tell you, said Albert wearily, that a chit of a girl means a small girl. He thinks you may have misheard me. Susan hunched up in the chair. Albert pulled up another one and sat down. How old are you? Sixteen. Oh, my. Albert rolled his eyes. How long have you been sixteen? Since I was fifteen, of course. Are you stupid? My, my, how the time does pass, said Albert. Do you know why you're here? No, but, Susan hesitated, but it's got something to do with, it's something like, I'm seeing things that people don't see, and I've met someone who's just a story, and I know I've been here before, and all these skulls and bones on things, Albert's rangy, vulture-like shape loomed over her. Would you like a cocoa, he said. It was a lot different from the cocoa at the school which was like hot brown water. Albert's cocoa had fat floating in it, if you turned the mug upside down, it would be a little while before anything fell out. Your mum and dad, said Albert, when she had a chocolate mustache that was far too young for her, did they ever, explain anything to you? Miss Del Cross did that in biology, said Susan. She got it wrong, she added. I mean about your grandfather, said Albert. I remember things, said Susan, but I can't remember them until I've seen them. Like the bathroom. Like you. Your mum and dad thought it best if you forgot, said Albert. Ha. Huh. It's in the bone. They was afraid it was going to happen and it has. You've inherited. Oh, I know about that, too said Susan. It's all about mice and beans and things. Albert gave her a blank look. Look, I'll try to put it tactful, he said. Susan gave him a polite look. Your grandfather is death, said Albert. You know? The skeleton in the black robe? You rode in on his horse and this is his house. Only he's, gone away. To think things over, or something. What I reckon's happening is you're being sucked in. It's in the bone. You're old enough now. There's a hole and it thinks you're the right shape. I don't like it any more than you do. Death, said Susan, flatly. Like the hog father and the sandman and the tooth fairy. Yes. Squeak. 
You expect me to believe that, do you? said Susan, trying to summon up her most withering scorn. Albert glared back like someone who'd done all his withering a long time ago. It's no skin off my nose what you believe, madam, he said. You really mean the tall figure with the scythe and everything? Yes. Look, Albert, said Susan, in the voice one's uses to the simple-minded, even if there was a death like that, and frankly it's quite ridiculous to go anthropomorphizing a simple natural function, no one can inherit anything from it. I know about heredity. It's all about having red hair and things. You get it from other people. You don't get it from, myths and legends. Um. The death of rats had gravitated to the cheeseboard, where he was using his scythe to hack off a lump. Albert sat back. I remember when you got brought here, he said. He'd kept on asking, you see. He was curious. He likes kids. Sees a lot of them really, but, not to get to know, if you see what I mean. Your mum and dad didn't want to, but they gave in and brought you all here for tea one day just to keep him quiet. They didn't like to do it because they thought you'd be scared and scream the place down. But you, you didn't scream. You laughed. Frightened the life out of your dad, that did. They brought you a couple more times when he asked, but then they got scared about what might happen and your dad put his foot down and that was the end of it. He was about the only one who could argue with the master, your dad. You'd have been about four then. I think. Susan raised her hand thoughtfully and touched the pale lines on her cheek. The master said they were raising you according to, Albert sneered, modern methods. Logic. And thinking old stuff is silly. I dunno, I suppose they wanted to keep you away from, ideas like this, I was given a ride on the horse, said Susan, not listening to him. I had a bath in the big bathroom. Soap all over the place, said Albert. His face contorted into something approaching a smile. I could hear the master laughing from here. And he made you a swing, too. Tried to, anyway. No magic or anything. With his actual hands. Susan sat while memories woke and yawned and unfolded in her head. I remember about that bathroom now, she said. It's all coming back to me. Nat, it never went away. It just got papered over. He was no good at plumbing. What does Y.M.R.C.I.G.B.S.A. A.M. mean? Young men's reformed cultists of the Icor God Bel Shamharoth Association, Ankh Morpork, said Albert. It's where I stay if I have to go back down for anything. Soap and such like. But you're not, a young man, said Susan, unable to prevent herself. No one argues, he snapped. And Susan thought that was probably true. There was some kind of wiry strength in Albert, as if his whole body was a knuckle. He can make just about anything, she said, half to herself but some things he just doesn't understand, and one of them's plumbing. Right. We had to get a plumber from Ankh Morpork, ha, huh? he said he'd might be able to make it a week next Thursday, and you don't say that kind of thing to the master, said Albert. I've never seen a bugger work so fast. Then the master just made him forget. He can make everyone forget, except Albert stopped, and frowned. Seems I've got to put up with it, he said. Seems you've a right. I expect you're tired. You can stay here. There's plenty of rooms. No, I've got to get back. There'll be terrible trouble if I'm not at school in the morning. There's no time here except what people brings with them. Things just happen one after the other. Think you'll take you right back to the time you left if you like. But you ought to stop here a while. You said there's a hole and I'm being sucked in. 
I don't know what that means. You'll feel better after a sleep, said Albert. There was no real day or night here. That had given Albert trouble at first. There was just the bright landscape and, above, a black sky with stars. Death had never got the hang of day and night. When the house had human inhabitants it tended to keep a 26-hour day. Humans, left to themselves, adopt a longer diurnal rhythm than the 24-hour day, so they can be reset like a lot of little clocks at sunset. Humans have to put up with time, but days are a sort of personal option. Albert went to bed whenever he remembered. Now he sat up, with one candle alight, staring into space. She remembered about the bathroom, he muttered. And she knows about things she couldn't have seen. She couldn't have been tall. She's got his memory. She inherited. Squeak, said the death of rats. He liked to sit by the fire at night. Last time he went off people stopped dying, said Albert. But they ain't stopped dying this time. And the horse went to her. She's fill in the hole. Albert glared at the darkness. When he was agitated it showed by a sort of relentless chewing and sucking activity, as if he was trying to extract some forgotten morsel of tea time from the recesses of a tooth. Now he was making a noise like a hairdresser's U-bend. He couldn't remember ever having been young. It must have happened thousands of years ago. He was 79 but time in death's house was a reusable resource. He was vaguely aware that childhood was a tricky business, especially toward the end. There was all the business with pimples and bits of your body having a mind of their own. Running the executive arm of mortality was certainly an extra problem. But the point was, the horrible, inescapable point was, that someone had to do it. For, as has been said before, Death operated in general rather than particular terms, just like a monarchy. If you are a subject in a monarchy, you are ruled by the monarch. All the time. Waking or sleeping. Whatever you or they happen to be doing. It's part of the general conditions of the situation. The queen doesn't actually have to come around to your actual house, hog the chair and the TV remote control and issue actual commands about how one is parched and would enjoy a cup of tea. It all takes place automatically, like gravity. Except that, unlike gravity, it needs someone at the top. They don't necessarily have to do a great deal. They just have to be there. They just have to be. Her, said Albert. Squeak. She'll crack soon enough, said Albert. Oh, yes. You can't be an immortal and immortal at the same time, it'll tear you in half. I almost feel sorry for her. Squeak, agreed the death of rats. And that ain't the worst bit, said Albert. You wait till her memory really starts working, Squeak. You listen to me, said Albert. You'd better start looking for him right away. Susan awoke and had no idea what time it was. There was a clock by the bedside, because death knew there should be things like bedside clocks. It had skulls and bones and the omega sign on it, and it didn't work. There were no working clocks in the house, except the special one in the hall. Any others got depressed and stopped, or unwound themselves all in one go. Her room looked as though someone had moved out yesterday. There were hairbrushes on the dressing table, and a few odds and ends of makeup. There was even a dressing gown on the back of the door. It had a rabbit on the pocket. The cozy effect would have been improved if it hadn't been a skeletal one. She had a rummage through the drawers. This must have been her mother's room. There was a lot of pink. Susan had nothing against pink in moderation, but this wasn't it. She put on her old school dress. The important thing, she decided, was to stay calm. There was always a logical explanation for everything, even if you had to make it up. 
scove. The death of rats landed on the dressing table, claws scrabbling for a purchase. He removed the tiny scythe from his jaws. I think, said Susan carefully, that I would like to go home now, thank you. The little rat nodded, and leapt. It landed on the edge of the pink carpet and scurried away across the dark floor beyond. When Susan stepped off the carpet the rat stopped and looked around in approval. Once again, she felt she'd passed some sort of test. She followed it out into the hall and then into the smoky cavern of the kitchen. Albert was bent over the stove. Morning, he said, out of habit rather than any acknowledgement of the time of day. You want fried bread with your sausages? There's porridge to follow. Susan looked at the mess sizzling in the huge frying pan. It wasn't a sight to be seen on an empty stomach, although it could probably cause one. Albert could make an egg wish it had never been laid. Haven't you got any muesli, she said. Is that some kind of sausage, said Albert suspiciously. It's nuts and grains. Any fat in it? I don't think so. How are you supposed to fry it, then? You don't fry it. You call that breakfast. It doesn't have to be fried to be breakfast, said Susan. I mean, you mentioned porridge, and you don't fry porridge who says? A boiled egg, then. Ha, boiling's no good, it don't kill off all the germs. Boil me an egg, Albert. As the echoes bounced and died away, Susan wondered where the voice had came from. Albert's ladle tinkled on the tiles. Please, said Susan. You did the voice, said Albert. Don't bother about the egg, said Susan. The voice had made her jaw ache. It worried her even more than it worried Albert. After all, it was her mouth. I want to go home. You are home, said Albert. This place? This isn't my home. Yet? What's the inscription on the big clock? Too late, said Susan promptly. Where are the beehives? In the orchard. How many plates ve we got? Seven Susan shut her mouth firmly. See? It's home to part of you, said Albert. Look, Albert, said Susan, trying sweet reason in case it worked any better this time round. Maybe there is, someone, sort of, in charge of things but I'm really no one special, I mean, yet? How come the horse knows you? Yes, but I really am just a normal girl normal girls didn't get a my little binky set on their third birthday, snapped Albert. Your dad took it away. The master was very upset about that. He was trying. I mean I'm an ordinary kid. Listen, ordinary kids get a xylophone. They don't just ask their granddad to take his shirt off. I mean I can't help it. That's not my fault. It's not fair. Really? Oh, why didn't you say, said Albert sourly. That cuts a lot of thin ice, that does. I should just go out now, if I was you, and tell the universe that it's not fair. I bet it'll say, oh, all right then, sorry you've been troubled, you're let off. That's sarcasm. You can't talk to me like that. You're just a servant. That's right. And so are you. So I should get started, if I was you. The rat'll help. He mainly does rats, but the principle's the same. Susan sat with her mouth open. I'm going outside, she snapped. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.